and action. Action. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Grudge Report. Things are a little different for this special Halloween episode because there's no frock. I have Beth Johnson with me who works at the SETI Institute and who is a familiar face for any of you who have tuned into the Grudge Report. As am I, I'm Margaret Reeb, and we usually do our own grudge reports, but we both like scary movies and we both like Halloween. And so we decided to do a special edition of the grudge report where we talk about John Carpenter's The Thing, the original, which came out in 1982. Well, now, now I have to correct you a little bit because it is a remake of, of a 1951 movie, The Thing from Another World. So it's not correct. quite. <laughs> Not quite original, but considered original. Yes, because there have been redos of this version of the movie because it was based on a novel, novella from the 1950s and someone else tried to make a, a movie about it. What was the name that you, the name, the thing from? The thing a, from another world. The thing from another world, but from and what then I read, it was. It's, Circle. Based on a, a book called, a story called uh, Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. Yes. So perhaps it's not the most OG, but it is in, uh, it's the most well-known adaptation yeah. of the novella, I will say. So we're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to spoil it and talk about the science, overanalyze the science. But before we do that, Beth, do you want to give a summary of the movie as spoiler free as possible and and tell us whether or not you liked it before we dive into the details okay well I have to make a confession I'm not a scary movie person so I like oh. this was this was um and I, I got a lot of like content warnings from family because they were like oh well I gotta warn you about this and I gotta warn you about that because it might bother you and I was like all right guys I can I think I can handle it but okay um, but honestly, I actually really, I, I liked it. Like it was really good. Um, so basically what it is, is it's a science fiction horror movie where they're at a base in Antarctica. It's a, a small research outpost. It is the first week of winter, um, which would put it in like our summertime. Um, and there's basically a skeleton crew. We don't know what kind of research they're doing and we're never told, but the movie opens with this, opens with this weird chase scene from a helicopter where they're shooting at a dog, which, you know, I'm going to give you the content warning right there. Like this movie, there are dogs and, and not all nice things happen to dogs in this movie. So, um, it's, it's pretty psychological in that there's a lot of a lack of trust amongst people. You never know who is a problem. Um, and it turns out that there's like this whole alien crash landed spaceship thing going on. And uh, it it's not a happy movie. I'm not going to say this is one of those like horror movies you get to the end of and you're like, wow, people lived. No, 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 it, no, it's not a happy ending. So, um, but it was really good. And I really liked the psychology of it. And I really liked the fact that we were dealing with scientists and not teenagers in, you know, who are like, oh, I'm going to go check out the dark basement. Like these guys actually were like, don't do the dumb things. And so we're trying to like reason out and be logical and, and you know, math and science their way through all of the, you know, stuff that they had to deal with. And that was, that was a different a different kind of horror movie for me. So I kind of liked that. It wasn't your like typical slasher flick. Yes. Uh, I didn't know you don't, don't like scary movies. So this must have been quite a stretch for you. Um, I love scary movies and thriller <laughs> movies. And I loved this movie. Uh, we'll get into the like spoilery part of it. But when you try to apply science to it, it gets a little wonky. But like you were said, there's a lot of issues with mistrust and it's very claustrophobic. It's very nihilistic. So kind of addresses, you know, that sort of viewpoint of like, there's no point of anything and we can't control anything, which should tell you a lot about what happens to the people in the movie and the dogs, unfortunately. Um, I love John Carpenter and this movie reminded me a lot of Alien. It mm -hmm. was released, you know, around the same time and so I think there are a lot of spiritual alignments there but um I thought it was great too so do you want to do the spoiler warning or do you have anything else to say to all the folks who tuned in who maybe want to hit pause and go watch the thing run away now run away we're going to get into spoilery science 
spoilery science. And if it's any consolation, I love horror movies and I watched this for the first time last night. So there are probably tons of people who definitely need to go watch it and then come back. I mean, I'm of an age and I'd never seen it. So, you know, that was the, I watched it for the first time on Monday night. So I, I feel you. There we go. All right. I suppose if you're still here, you're one of the fearless folks who has seen this movie and or doesn't mind getting spoiled. So let's get into the details. Beth, do you want to start with the setting? Do you want to talk about Antarctica for a minute? Yeah, because it, I'm, I think it's a great setting. I think it's a really interesting setting. And at the same time, I'm, there were a lot of things that bothered me about it because I do have, we do have associates um, here at the SETI Institute and at previous places I've been that have actually gone and worked in Antarctica and I've heard their stories. So there were a few things that really kind of bothered me. One was the fact that they're doing this at winter. And yes, it's a skeleton crew and there's not very many people. But at the same time, like I, I was sort of surprised that that they said it was like the first week of winter. And of course, it's pretty much dark after the first day, which was also kind of strange because if you're in the first week of winter I would have expected it to be darker much more by that point but okay and then the sun never comes up again in the movie so that was also like wow okay we just dove right in so there are some setting issues right off and then one of the things that just continued to bother me throughout the movie was how like lightly dressed these guys were for Antarctica in winter so you know, you see McCready, which is Kurt Russell's character, and half the time he doesn't have a face covering. He's just got the beard, which is great. But I kept going, like, are your ears frozen, dude? Like, what are you and doing there out any here? there weren't any icicles in the beard. There I, weren't any icicles. give us that. Yeah, right? I mean, I think there was one time I noticed some icicles kind of forming right around his mouth. But other than that, no, there weren't. And it was like... Eh, that was a little... That was a bit of a stretch for me. And I... It was... So the movie was filmed in... um or the outdoor parts of it were filmed in uh, Stewart, British Columbia, which is one of the colder spots in North America, it has like the most snowfall or something. And so like they were doing it at a location that was perfectly reasonable for mimicking it. But I still feel like they didn't quite have it down. Like that was that was still seemed a little bit nicer than you would have gotten from Antarctica. Um, and it was also interesting how like they could never contact uh the the main base like that was that was kind of wild i'm like eh, okay i guess i don't know See, i'm not like an expert a big problem that, that yeah they i mean sorted out before yeah. they took dogs in so I, <laughs> I don't know how much food they had but i wouldn't i mean i assume that the dogs are for are for our sled dogs we never actually see them like used as sled dogs so I have no idea I mean there was there's a lot of like scenic stuff in the movie that's never really touched upon it's just sort of like it's a research station here's some sciencey stuff mm -hmm. we yeah. don't know what like, they're what there doing are they doing exactly yeah. and as you like, mentioned most science happens I would assume not in winter because of the harsh conditions and so I, I, maybe they're just there maintaining things like you said I don't know but they don't even talk about what they're there to do in general no don't time. don't expect a lot of of exposition in this movie there is there is zero exposition in this movie it's basically you start off with a helicopter chase a dog for no apparent reason there's you have no idea what's going on apparently and my husband looked this up there's a moment when the the so they're being chased by norwegian scientists who are trying to shoot the dog and the guy gets into the camp and is yelling in Norwegian and they don't give you a translation of it. There's no, there's no translation. And my husband said he looked up on the, uh, looked this up and apparently it really is real Norwegian. And they're basically yelling. It's the don't, it's not a dog. It's, you know, we have to kill it. It's not really a dog. It just looks like one. And so like they, there were some really cool touches like that in there, but there's a lot of no explanation given kind of stuff like we you know you sort of know what people's roles are as you kind of go along through the movie you figure it out like okay this guy's the doctor and this guy's the leader and this guy's the pilot and mm -hmm. and, and then it was like eh, okay and there's not a woman un in sight anywhere <laughs> yeah and I, I felt a little bit like there were some stereotypes 
that were very uncomfortable to watch. It is a movie of its time, unfortunately. So that's another content warning you should be aware of, even though I, if you're here, you might have seen it already. But yeah, it was very testosterone heavy. It was very, yeah, very much. And and that's fine. Like I said, it, you know, made in 1982. It is what it is. Um, I've, I don't have an objection to it looking at it through that kind of lens. It was just, it was sort of striking though, when you get used to like what we see now to realize like there's, there's not a single female in this, in this place. And like, that's not the case now. Cause one of my colleagues who's been, is one of my, is a woman, one of my professors. And so, you know, I know it's done, <laughs> Yes, but it was, it was, it was just sort of, that was striking. So it was definitely, um, I, so yeah, I so there's it as well. There's, there's my big issues with, with the movie right off. Those are my main ones. Like the, the setting was really cool, but I don't necessarily think it was a hundred percent accurate um, and noticeably so. And I just feel like it was not necessarily a very well-balanced cast. Let's just put it that way. It was a good cast. It was a good cast. And there you will have familiar faces several decades younger than you're used to I think my response was oh my gosh it's a young Wilfred Brimley and I went well okay it's a younger Wilfred Brimley because <laughs> he's not really young in this movie either <laughs> but he's not the you know like the old man that we got used to a few decades ago wow. so you know uh, Kurt Russell still looks like Kurt Russell uh it's Kurt Russell at like you know in his John Carpenter phase so his escape from New York kind of time period and honestly Kurt Russell still looks like Kurt Russell so <laughs> yes I will say I think this is one of his first big movies maybe I'm wrong there but I know he and John Carpenter had a partnership that kind of went on um, well I I definitely know that like this is kind of the start of his partnership with with John Carpenter but you know Kurt Russell was big in Disney films before that so that's true He's he's but it was a very different Kurt Russell. Yes. <laughs> so yes it, was not the, this, but, it was not the action figure Kurt Russell that we're all kind it of wasn't the you know, reluctant protagonist of a of yeah, the a anti-hero down kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I do a uh, Kurt Russell is is great. But I guess now at this point we can kind of talk a little bit about the fact that there is some sort of creature that has mm-hmm. infected. We don't know who, but it has infected some folks in this Antarctic base, the U.S. base. You see, what we're talking about here is an organism that imitates other life forms, and it imitates them perfectly. When this thing attacked our dogs, it tried to digest them, absorb them, and in the process, shape its own cells to imitate them. This, for instance, that's not dog. Imitation. We got to it before it had time to finish. Finish what? Finish imitating these dogs. And we figure out that the Norwegians who were chasing the poor dog who had become infected had dug something up mm-hmm. from the ice. And so, yeah, there was a uh, spaceship that crash landed. Um, it's very much your typical uh, flying saucer UFO. And then they had dug something out of the ice, a big block, and thawed it out. And then it basically took out all of them. So it was your body count when you start the movie is unbeknownst to you, eight already and uh, rapidly approaching 10. Um, My my son was watching it with us and he was keeping count. So and then we just kind of lost track because after a while it was like everybody. It's just everybody. Everybody. Everybody gets taken out. And I will say one of the first things that got to me about the movie, though I know it's necessary for the plot, was the fact that they the Americans who went to the Norwegian station brought this weird creature that they find that they think is dead back to their base. And they're, they don't have any protective covering. They're just touching it. And then they proceed to like cut it up. And I don't know about you, but if I found a weird body horror alien spaceship thing, I'd leave it where it is. <laughs> but I mean, um, and that's and that's very much like that gets into that whole like stereotypical scientist, you know, mindset, right? Like we don't know what it is. We have to figure it out. 
Like it's not necessarily a, we don't know what it is and maybe we should just leave it alone. That never really kind of comes into play. It's the, we don't know what it is, so we should figure it out and we should study it and understand it, which is a very, which, you know, if we didn't have scientists who thought like this, like, where would we be? So I, I get the mentality. Um, and if you don't know when you're in a horror movie, I mean, really, you're going to do the thing. So you're going to do it. Exactly. It's necessary for the plot, but I think even a scientist would take protective measures probably, right? I think about planetary protection and all the things we put in place not to contaminate our planet or the planets that we're going to, but maybe they were just so excited about this discovery that they couldn't help themselves. (laughs) Well, and you know, I mean, if, if when you first see the, the body that, that has been burned uh, at the Norwegian camp, it's this like dual body, right? You know, like Mm -hmm. that's pulling apart and you have no idea what's going on, except that it's been basically burned to a crisp, but it's got really weird long claws and, Honestly, the whole thing kind of starts to to break down a little bit there science wise for me, because if it can mimic the dog so well and but then it has like these moments where it's it's like, is there a true form for this thing? I think that's where I'm going here. Is there a true form for this thing for the thing? Right. Like I completely get the name of it now. Right. It's yes. It's, it's, so that's a very, yes, we could go totally down this rabbit hole and I want to, because what we learn about this creature is that it, whatever it is, if it's a parasite, a single celled organism, or if it's something a little bit, you know, more complex, it, it's cells somehow when they come into contact with another creature, mold with it, or they call it assimilation in the movie. And then they're able to replicate the cells that they assimilated perfectly so when people or dogs or birds or you know bacteria I'm guessing are hanging out you don't really know if they're the bacteria or the dog or the person or if they're the thing and that's where the claustrophobia and the trust issues come in but you're right Beth because it's slowly all the characters peel back aspects and it just seems to constantly change what yeah. what the thing can do because we never see the thing as the thing. It's always something half. It's always it's always got here. pieces of of dog or pieces of person or whatever. It it's always influenced by um, the cellular structures that it's taken on already, and and that leads me to the, one of the other things that kind of was cool for for the time. And yet bothered me was uh, when when the doctor is is analyzing or the scientist is analyzing the biology and he's watching uh, the program run on his screen. And it's you know, it does the whole like, here's the alien cell and it touches the dog cell and it becomes the dog cell. And I'm like, okay, totally with you here. And then that dog cell runs off and like consumes other dog cells. I'm like, ah, now I'm not really with you here. Wait, what? Like, I would think that like it would be replicating, not consuming, because that's what you'd want to do to take over the structure is, you know, quickly learn to do that. And there's a lot of different types of cells in in any animal, for the most part, like mammals. We'll we'll go with mammals and things like that. There's there's lots of different types of cells. So when you're saying it replicates a dog cell, like what what is it? Is it replicating? Yeah. What is it doing? Is it is it getting into the (laughs) DNA? Like, what are we doing here? So there was. It was a little, again, this movie is light on explanation. Um, but the point of the software, of the, of the program that he ran, was really gets you to the heart of why this is, this particular story is terrifying. He basically comes to the conclusion, or the software comes to the conclusion that if it gets out into the human population off of Antarctica, where it can actually spread, it will basically wipe out all of life on earth in 27,000 hours, which is about three years ish. And that's it. Like it'll just, it'll just wipe out everything, which brings me to your, you know, and that's terrifying, right? Like, and, and for all that we get to the end of the movie and we think that like we've contained it, we haven't contained anything, right? Like there's two people still alive. There's rescuers that are going to be coming. There's still going to be like, bodies and pieces and we've already shown at one point that this thing like reacts no matter what state it's in right so I don't think anybody's safe (laughs) no and it to me you also never really know when it's 
dead because some of the bodies that have been burned come back alive and some of them don't seem to, but as we said, there's something that happens where if a creature, if the thing is taken over or something can actually break apart. And there's this wonder, in my opinion, wonderful, because I just thought it was so funny and terrifying scene where one of the people gets taken over by the thing and then it starts to, you know, change. And then its head comes off and it sprouts spider legs and it like whittles away. And so there's that we, I'm sure that there are the, there are instances of the thing still persisting in this base somewhere right so we're not right and, and and we're not even talking about like the norwegian base right like the dog mm-hmm. ran off from that particular base were there other dogs like we never know were there other dogs at the base i mean if they had one member of the sled crew then wouldn't they have like more members of the where are the rest of these dogs like they never again light on explanations so it's I, you get to the end of the movie and you're like, yeah, I don't really feel safe. <laughs> I don't really feel like this is a I've killed the big bad kind of situation. It's, no. No. And and the scene that you're talking about where the, the head kind of runs off was also the one moment where I actually jumped in this movie. So they're they're doing the defibrillation on the on the guy who who's hit his head and they're trying to bring him back. And and they they the doctors up there just, you know given it all he's got with these the, the paddles and like i think it's the third time he does it like the chest opens up and there's these giant teeth and he like the doc loses his hands and it's just like whoa what <laughs> just happened here and again it's that like you don't know what to expect from this creature clearly anything it has ever taken over is something it can call back to to memory and you made a really good point before we actually started recording was that did this spaceship land willingly or unwillingly did this creature was this on board that spaceship and it took over the host and what and you know took everything out and what's happened is that spaceship has crashed and it was trying to get away and got frozen before it could like go and spread more stuff so which I think actually, honestly, Margaret, is a really great hypothesis. Like, I don't think, I don't think this is necessarily one of those things that you willingly like run off and do. It doesn't seem like something that's very technologically advanced to me, right? Build it's a not, spaceship, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't like it takes over things, but it doesn't necessarily like we don't know how much it actually knows of what those you know what those people know right like does it is it learning things along with that is it gaining those kinds of memories and and capabilities i we don't know there's things we can think about but yeah it's yeah but i I, yeah yeah and i yes and i'm sure i'm not the first person to think of this but i just thought if if this thing really was sentient and it wanted to take over earth because in, in every horror action movie, when the aliens are the antagonists, the aliens want something from Earth, right? And in this instance, it makes sense that this cre- this thing would want more food, even though it doesn't really behave like a parasite looking for food, which we can talk about later. But I, I would imagine it would have landed somewhere like New York City or, you know, Seoul, where there are a bunch of people instead of Antarctica so that's my right. thought is that it the aliens were you know there was some fight and it just landed and this is a parasite for the aliens too yeah and I think honestly I think that's a really good reasonable hypothesis for for how this went I mean I haven't read the original story so I don't know what else is in there um but yeah it's again this is a show where we overanalyze stuff right like that's and what we're gonna we do. do it <laughs> because that chest scene, I loved that scene as well, but I don't really understand why it the thing would have attacked at that point because the doctor was trying to bring Norris. Norris was the guy who got infected back to life. And I thought, well, that's probably good for the thing. Why would it want to be? There's some ongoing thing in the film where if the infection goes so long, the person stop, the host stops breathing. And I thought that seems silly because then how are you getting energy? I don't know, but maybe again, I'm overanalyzing, but I also (laughs) know that that scene was an awesome horror movie scene, but I Oh yeah, no, that's, that is a, that is a very, very good horror movie scene. I, there are a lot of beats in this movie that are really, really good. And on the one hand, I can understand why it was critically panned when it came out. 
on the other hand, and on the other hand, I can totally understand why it gained the cult following that it did. Right. It is, it is definitely a really good horror movie. Um, from the psychological standpoint of things, I really enjoyed it. I, the paranoia was just fun, really. <laughs> I thought Kurt Russell's character, McReady, I thought he had been infected hands down until the blood test. I, I thought that he was, I know. Well, yeah. Did we see in this, did, did we do a blood test on him? Cause I don't remember. Yes. So that, I okay. think we should talk about the blood test. Cause that was also um an interesting scene because they they figure out that it, it, the thing infects every cell in your body and so you can use theoretically and in this universe you can use blood to figure out if well basically if you try to yeah if you try to right? injure any part of the alien then it will react so the whole thing is that like if it's in the blood then the blood will defend itself from damage so, which I think is really cool because they lo- they lose the the original method they were going to use to figure out who was infected and who wasn't, right? And that was okay. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I need to go watch it again just to like piece all the pieces back together. Like, oh, there's yeah. still a lot of wait. Who did what when? It's kind of a murder mystery too at the same time, which is really wild. Somebody, I, I believe the writer said that he thought of it as an Agatha Christie. Uh, uh, and mystery because it really is that where there are tons of videos on YouTube and and Reddit thread if you're so inclined where people break down who they think does what when uh, mm. and it's crazy but to your point somebody mysteriously got rid of their original test and so we have to do this other test Windows Yo. you tie a Palmer over here We're gonna draw a little bit of everybody's blood. We're gonna find out who's the thing. Watching Norris in there gave me the idea that maybe every part of him was a whole. Every little piece was an individual animal with a built-in desire to protect its own life. You see, when a man bleeds, it's just tissue. My blood from one of you things won't obey when it's attacked. It'll try and survive. It'll crawl away from a hot needle, say. Basically makes everybody like cut themselves and pour like I don't a couple ounces of blood in a petri dish, a lot which of blood. which which as you noted was sort of like. Did we really need that much blood for this test? And then he heats up uh, using the flamethrower. I love this part. He heats up the uh, a wire and basically sticks it into the blood to see if like the the heat from that wire will cause the blood to react and defend itself against injury. And it works. <laughs> you start to think magic. that it's. Yeah, you start to think that it's not going to work and that like you're never going to know who's infected, but then it actually does work. And then it's just, wow. And then it is all goes to hell from there. Really. Yeah, blood comes out of a Petri dish, which is not scientifically accurate, but amazing. So <laughs> lean in, just lean in. Just the, lean the in. Yeah, like really. Yes. I, I kind of wish I'd watched this movie without being getting ready to like do an analysis of it because I might have just like turned off pieces of my brain a little bit more. But as it was, I was like, mm, would that happen? Would, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. So. Yes. Like, and I will say for all I've noticed that I say and I will say a lot. So I'm <laughs> going to try and not use that. One of the points I wanted to make was that. I love analyzing the science. Obviously, that's why I am here. But I think part of the point is that you're not supposed to fully understand it's supposed to defy your our understanding even science's understanding which Mm -hmm. may sound like I'm making apologies for the fact that this is a 1980s monster movie but it does lend itself to the nihilistic tone of the movie and this cosmic horror of forces that we just can never comprehend um and I did like the spider head, as I've noted. So I'll make excuses until <laughs> everyone gets on board. But 
um, yeah, it, 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 for being a crew of scientists for the most part, it was interesting that there wasn't a little bit more scientific analysis, in my opinion, that would have lent itself an interesting thread in the movie that wasn't pulled. My yeah. Thoughts, and, you think? and again, I think it's not, it, I really do. I kind of, I, I appreciate the Agatha Christie comparison because I really do think that is one of the things that would be good to do with this movie is to go back and say like, okay, who's where, when, and map out like what happened? Because I still have questions. I still have questions, you know, and it doesn't matter. Everybody's dead at the end, basically. Like nobody's surviving this movie and probably nobody's surviving on earth because it's just not, it's not going to go well for anyone. Um, but yeah, I do still have like a lot of questions. And I think that's a, I think that's one of the the things that makes it a, such a, a classic movie is you walk out and you're not sure what you just watched. You're not sure what just happened. And you, you want to go see it again because you're, you're thinking, well, wait, but what about, did that happen? Who did what to when? And so that makes a good movie because it's rewatchable, even though, you know, the ending, you still have so many other things that you could go back and, and revisit it for and figure out like what was going on at the time. So I, I yes. will stand by the fact that I think this is an excellent horror movie. I do agree that it is one of the quintessential ones to watch um, right up there with, with alien and, you know, your day of the dead, you know, night of the living dead and things like that. Like, I think these, these are quintessential things. I just, I think this one is a lot more rewatchable than others because there is that mystery aspect to it. Yes, for sure. Should we talk about the end of the movie? Because that's also a nice segue into the mystery of it. Or is there another aspect that we should dive into before we go? No, I think, I think we can move on to the ending. <laughs> so this is ultimate spoiler. So if you were just listening because you aren't afraid of getting spoiled, I would definitely pause now because we're going to talk about the ending of the movie, which as Beth says is, is figuring out who is who and who's doing what and who survives to the end is really awesome the first time you watch it. So at the end, we have two people. One is Kurt Russell, of course, because he's our protagonist, McReady, McReady, I'm not sure you pronounce his name, in the film. And then Childs, who is another person at the... Uh, outpost. I'm not 100% sure of his job, but he is one of the main voices of reason and one of the folks who's like, don't do that, do this. Do that. He's has and a very, you know. He is played by Keith David, who is now one of the like most famous actors. And this was his first big role. So this is actually like where Keith David started becoming kind of like a bit of a household name. And if you don't know who Keith David is, trust me, if you go look him up on IMDb, you will be like, oh my gosh, that's Keith David. So. <laughs> He has done a lot of voiceover work. You've heard him in everything. So, but yeah, so at the end of this movie, we're left with two, like one big star and one not big star and they've blown everything. Well, we know that McReady has blown everything up. We don't know where Childs was or what he was doing, but we also don't know like, McCready's status a lot of the time either right because we're kind of seeing most of this movie through the lens of, of his experiences so we're left with these two guys basically sitting outside this blown up um burning research station <laughs> and and they're basically just like yeah we're dead we know all right kind of yes, smoke them yes. if you got them <laughs> yes exactly and you're right because both of these characters past the blood test that we just talked about where their blood didn't react to the hot wire. And so you think they're safe, but child, we see him watching the door and then he disappears and his excuse. I mean, if I was a parent and my child gave me this excuse, I would definitely think they were lying. He says that he thought he saw one of the other characters out in the storeroom. And so he decided to wander out after him and just happened to come back after all the action. Which is really out of character for this guy, because as you said, this is the guy who's been like, don't do the thing. Like he has been the, please mm -hmm. don't do the thing. I don't trust you. Don't do the thing. Just kill, you know, he has basically been very much opposed to a lot of the actions that have been taken. So for him to suddenly go, oh, well, I saw dude and decided to go like take care of it myself is sort of, really did you mm -hmm. so 
And I think when he disappears, that's when the generator is destroyed. Something happens when he's gone too, and you aren't sure if it was him or one of the other characters who was infected, but it's not adding up to me. I'm, I'm, I, I personally believe that Childs has been infected. That's what I think, but. I, I don't disagree with you, but then again, I don't think McCready's safe at this point anymore either, so. No, also because <laughs> it's, it's a little confusing how you can get infected because I think there was one character who got licked by a dog on screen and he passes the blood test yeah so but and mccready was also i mean if they've exploded some of these creatures i would imagine particles are in the air anyways i'm turning my science head off but it's it yeah i think they're both well and in good shape you know if you think about like how often we shed cells to begin with so like they're just around so how how many cells do, does this creature need to become someone else right and does it does it have to infest the host can it you know we've seen it kind of mimics them so like where where's the line on this and again you know there's so many questions left unanswered that that it is in that way kind of scarier because you're like i don't know what it's capable of we never really do figure out all that it's capable of no no so yeah you get to the end and it's basically and nobody lives nope they are both going to die no matter if they're infected with the thing or not perhaps if they're infected with the thing they'll go into hibernation because they're they have no shelter in the winter at night in antarctica so it's a uh, it's bad news for everyone uh well yeah for both of them i suppose because there's only two of them and the rescue squad is coming and maybe they'll be infected too yeah, because it well, not even that it, it's not even that there's a rescue squad. It's that probably like resupplies or, you know, even if they don't need resupplies for the winter, when the next crew comes in in spring, like nobody's going to know any of this has happened. Right. Like nobody knows about any of this. The Norwegians didn't have a chance to communicate it. Apparently the the U.S. guys didn't have a chance to communicate it. They couldn't get a hold of, of their station. So, yeah, I. It, the ending leaves you kind of feeling like, well, that sucked. <laughs> yes. And one of the things that happens is the doctor who we find out later was trying to rebuild the spaceship after he'd become infected, he had become infected and he's the guy who does the simulation or I'm sorry, he's not, he's probably a doctor, but he's a scientist. He's not a medical yes. doctor. Um, he destroys the communication system, which is already blocked because of the storm but he destroys it so i'm guessing he destroys he destroys everything right like there's yes. that moment in this in the movie that we, and we forgot about that where he goes like completely off book basically and just takes a hatchet to everything you know the science equipment the the dogs um like nothing like he just takes out everything because he doesn't want this thing to get out at all and i don't know if that's you know if he's infected it's, it's i don't know is he infected at that point does he become infected later like again there's so many questions we have that that you know this is why you can have extensive reddit threads on who did what to whom and what who did what yes because he realizes that all is lost and he secludes himself <laughs> because of the simulation that we talked about where he realizes how bleak everything is Mm -hmm. so that's yes and there's a lot of uh mayhem and the body count definitely goes up when he realizes what's going on yeah. um but this is i like that this is an, an uh, to me it felt like an interesting approach to talking about aliens uh and it was you know being the study institute it was interesting to think about it, this alien and uh, whether it's a parasite or what it's doing and cosmic horror and dread. Mm -hmm. um, and I would recommend it to anybody who doesn't mind some monster body horror film. So, so what would you recommend it, Beth? What do you think? When, what does your I, kitty think? I am, my, my, my kitty is just happy if she gets scritches in the duration. <laughs> um, I would recommend it if, if you like horror movies, you like or even if you don't like horror movies, but you can manage a bit of gore. Um, it's not, 
it's very special effect gore right like this is not something where you're like oh wow that's really accurate it's squicky but it's not necessarily like there's just blood and guts everywhere i mean there is a bit but it doesn't it never felt like overdone to me it felt like necessary and if you can handle that and you like either mystery or horror or psychological kind of thriller thing going i it, it's got something for anybody in those genres really like it it's just you know it's just really good i i i have no objections to it <laughs> i may have questions but I think some of those questions are kind of part of the point. Exactly. And, you know, if you're a Kurt Russell fan, I would say give it a watch if you haven't already, you know, um, tell your friends about it because uh, you do see a lot of his face. Um, <laughs> and apparently um, it took him forever to grow that wonderful beard that he has in that. So um, and I was so corrected. I was corrected by my husband that actually Escape from New York came out before this. So this really? was not his first John Carpenter um, movie. Yeah. Okay, good. So we can correct ourselves. So there's no reason to leave a comment about that because we know we were wrong, primarily me. <laughs> but we would love to hear your thoughts in the comments about any Absolutely. of the points we make or the film itself, other films that are similar. Again, I immediately thought of Alien because uh, I think, you know, Beth, to your point, Alien also does a good job of pacing the gore and making it surprising and necessary and not overly gross for no reason. Um, so give us your recommendations your thoughts let us know what you think other you know halloween alien related costumes or thoughts please put them in the comments as well um there will be tons of links in the comments so you can get notified when we drop a new grudge report you can read more about the seti institute which is you know the generous sponsor of, of this show um if you don't know the seti institute is a nonprofit. And its mission is to understand the nature and origin of life in the universe. So this movie fits nicely into that. Um, and like I said, we're a nonprofit. So if you like The Grudge Report, if you like our analysis of the thing, if you like us just generally, or if you like the mission of the SETI Institute, feel free to poke around the website or drop if you us like a couple my cat, dollars. if you, you know. like the cat. It's, you know, there's a ton of things to like about the SETI Institute. So thank you for tuning in. I'm Margaret. Beth, do you have any parting words to say? Just thanks for watching, guys. And, you know, feel free to, to argue with us in the comments. We don't mind it. As long as you're polite, we will totally have discussions. So, and uh, check out our other shows. Yeah, check out our other shows. We, we cover uh, Star Trek Discovery. We cover The Expanse. And Margaret and Frank have been doing uh, Foundation. So, um, and there's more to come as all of the seasons start premiering in the next month or so. So, uh, tons of stuff to watch and uh, keep track of some of this uh, spooky SETI stuff that we're doing over the next few weeks because there's there's more to come and there are will be more um, movie recommendations at SETI.org so go check those out for some from sciencey horror movies that you can you might enjoy. Yes, thank you so much and we'll catch you next time. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Bye.